All right, good morning. Hello, everyone. Again, it's not, not quite raining the day I canceled, but I think it will be uh, raining by the time we would, would be leaving class. Good morning, baby. Thanks for saying hi. Yeah, it was, got pretty, uh, pretty rainy after our last, last class. That was um, kind of crazy. Should have canceled that. Okay, so today I want to pick back up with disinfection from where we left off on Tuesday. Um, I did tell you I was going to get you your critical review assignments back by today. Um, I might not get to that until tomorrow. I'm halfway through. It's not taking me a particularly long time, but I've just had lots of other commitments pop up, undergraduate advising amongst other things. Um, so I'll get those back to you tomorrow at the latest. Um, and I will email you each your, um, your graded work, essentially, with a few comments in, in it. Um, but today we'll, we'll stick with the disinfection. Um, we left off here with this problem last time, and so that's where I'm going to pick up now. So we were looking at this problem that said if 15 milligrams of HOCl is added to a potable water for disinfection, the final measured pH is 7, what percent of HOCl is not dissociated? And then it gave us a, it told us to assume that the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So I want to go through it, and then I also went ahead and added a few slides. Um, this current set of slides are now posted to, to Moodle, by the way, um, as of a few minutes ago. And I, I added a few slides just to kind of give a a refresher reminder about equilibrium equilibrium equations. So hopefully that'll um, that'll be helpful. I know last time it sounded like a, at least a couple of you um, might appreciate that. Okay, so this problem uh, I went ahead and told you when it said the temperature was twenty five degrees Celsius. That was essentially defining. A, an equilibrium constant here. We could look that up from a, a lookup table, um, but essentially that's that was the situation. And the next thing I said was we added HOCl to the system as HOCl. So in terms of a mass, we would say that's 15 milligrams per liter here of the HOCl itself. And then that would dissociate. We know that the what, what we're being asked for is that that ratio, um, and then really into um, percentage, so times 100%. What we're looking for is that ratio of how much HOCl is there compared to the total amount of chlorine in the system. The total amount of chlorine, of course, is going to be equal to the OCL minus plus HOCL in uh, molar terms. OK, so with that, um, we can go from here and essentially say that we need a way to solve for um, for this equation, this setup, and we can do that by getting a system of equations. And so our Ka relationship, we know that Ka is going to equal our H plus times OCL minus, these are our um, products, divided by, by our reactants, HOCl. Okay, so with that, then we now have two equations and two unknowns because we have OCL minus is an unknown and HOCL is an unknown. So from here, we can say that we can rearrange this and get essentially one of these in terms of the other. So we'll go ahead and get 
OCL minus in terms of the HOCL and the other two uh, components here. So we can say that's going to be Ka times HOCL divided by our H plus. Okay, so that gives us an equation. Now we can take this, uh, this formulation and insert it down here. And of course, there's, there are other ways we can, um, we can do this, but I'm gonna take that formulation and insert it where, where we have OCL minus, that way we can end up with the total in terms of just HOCL because we do know something about the total given that we added 15 milligrams per liter. So with that, we'll say the total is equal to Ka times HOCL divided by H plus. All that plus HOCL. Okay, so that gives us an equation where we have one unknown and we can solve. So then the, the final part would be to take that 15 milligrams per liter and I think I've got the uh, molecular weight here. We can take that 15 milligrams per liter, that's you know, 0 0.015 grams per liter if we know that the molecular weight of HOCL, I think it's what, 54, 52? Let's see if I have it handy. Okay, let's just real quickly. So this is going to be 16 for the O plus 1 for the hydrogen plus 34.45. Yeah, so should be, is that 51? But chlorine is 35, right? Not 34. Correct me if I'm wrong here, please. So I, that should then be 52.45 grams per mole. Okay, so we can use that then to figure out how many moles per liter of total chlorine were added, and then we can solve, um, solve for our, our um, equation there. So we'll take that 0 0.015 grams per liter, divide it by 52, 0.45 moles uh, grams per mole that will leave us with moles per liter at the end of it. And so when we do this, we end up with 2.86 times 10 to the minus 4. Moles per liter. So that's our total. Um, we can say that's our total. And then from there, we can solve for our HOCL. So I'm just going to go ahead to the next page. I've got more space. Um, so we said total was, was 2.86. So then from there we can say 
this is essentially equal to HFCL plus it was Ka times HFCL divided by H plus. So the last thing we need to do here is essentially get the terms, the like terms together. And one thing we can do, you'll notice here, is we can simply take the Ka divided by H plus and get that as an expression. And then this just becomes very, very simple. So this is gonna be 10 to the negative 7.54 divided by 10 to the negative seven. And so, you know, I'm not, not confident with the, uh, the tiny calculator there, so I'm gonna get, pull up Excel and just do that real quick. So we, we can say, this is equal to 10 to the negative 7.54 divided by 10 to the negative seven. So 0.288 is our ratio there. And in some sense, that's also the ratio of HOCL per OCL minus. That's 2.88, 0.288. So then if we just insert that here, then we can say this is equal to 1.288 times HOCL. Okay, then we have a way to solve for HOCL. And that is now 2.86 times 10 to the fourth, negative fourth moles per liter divided by 1.288. We'll give us an answer that is, we're almost there. So we'll take that, um, times 10 to the minus four divided by that. Um, oops. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. That is our moles per liter of our HFCL, 0 0.001 or we could say 1.001 .001 times 10 to the minus third. Yeah. Clearly I did something wrong. <laughs> that should be four, 10 to the minus four, right? Because I divided this, I'm making, making that number smaller, that should not get bigger. Did I forget a zero? Oh, half of it. Okay, sorry. 2.24 times 10 to the minus four. That makes more sense. I intended to grab some coffee before I started and I didn't, so I apologize. And I'm a little bit on the slow side this morning. Okay, so that's our HOCL. Then our our fraction that is our percent that is not dissociated is going to be 2.24. Essentially, we can just leave it as 2.24 divided by 
we don't even need the, uh, the 10 to the minus 4 um, times 100%. And so we can say that's going to be 78.3%. Okay, so to answer this question here, we see that at pH 7, about 78% of HOCl is not dissociated. And one thing you might notice is we actually did not need to solve with the actual amount of chlorine. So we, in the previous slide, we went ahead and used the molecular weight <clears throat> to get the grams per mole. We got the exact molar concentration, and then we were working with that moving forward. And as we went through these different steps, we see that at the end of the day, we actually just divided this ratio and it didn't matter so much what we started with. It, these are actually defined by this ratio here. In fact, just by looking at this ratio here, um, because we can get this ratio it's simply, by simply dividing um, This equation here, if we were to divide both sides by H+, plus, then we have a ratio of OCl minus compared to HOCl. That relationship there is actually pretty much all we needed. We didn't have to go and solve for the total itself. We could just do the substitutions. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way you go. The, the point is you don't always have to include those steps of solving for the, the mass if that ratio is sufficient. Because if you look at this, what is 1 minus 0.288? Um, oh, sorry, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, but, but you can use this 0.288 in, in reference to that total, like we did, and then it actually doesn't matter what values you have here. Um, you could put in a placeholder or just you keep the um, list them as variables and it would work out just the same. Okay, so I wanted to elaborate on this. Hopefully I have not just confused things there at the end. Um, I have a few slides to go back over these concepts. So with hopefully the combination of this problem and these next few slides, this will refresh your memory on solving equilibrium reactions, which are very important for chlorination um, and disinfection in general. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, reversible reactions are um, essentially equilibrium reactions are what we call reversible. I've got an illustration I, I'll show you in just a moment. Um, a lot of these are pH dependent, so we'll We'll graph them very frequently on an x-axis that is pH. Um, we have reactants and products. We list them in this manner I mentioned last time. So the lowercase letters are, that's the number of moles in the stoichiometric uh, setup. And then, you know, it's some species D, C, A, and B. So then we define our equilibrium constant as this arrangement of, of those concentrations. This also works for solubility reactions. So if you have a solid that is dissolving into water, typically that is a, um, an equilibrium reaction as well. And the solubility limit is essentially, or the uh, the solubility term is essentially an equilibrium term that tells us how much of it is going to partition into, into the liquid phase, um, into the uh, dissolved phase or not. Now, in that case, and in the case of uh, 
liquids in general, we treat the concentration of a solid or liquid as unity, as one. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at what that means for water in a moment, because water is actually in equilibrium as well. So water is in equilibrium with H plus and OH minus. So then the Ka for water, or maybe it would be easier to just simply write K with the W here for equilibrium constant for water, that's going to be the products times the reactants divided by, excuse me, the products divided by the reactants. And here we have water, but it's in liquid form. And so this becomes, because we're treating that liquid as one, this becomes OH minus times H plus divided by one. Okay. So with that, let's let's take a quick look at this um, illustration. So when we when we think about how reactions are going back and forth, this illustration online is fairly fairly helpful to understand where the equilibrium is going and how quickly it's getting there, things like that. Most of the time for our class, we're going to assume that it has reached at the equilibrium point. But sometimes you might be concerned with how long that takes. If it's a slow reaction, it might take a while. And so there's some dynamics that you might be interested in on the way to equilibrium. OK, so let me just go ahead and make sure that our sound through my desktop is working. All right, then. And I'll probably skip through this uh, demonstration to an extent. I'm going to mute my mic. So okay, this little demonstration kind of helps us with the idea of uh, equilibrium and reversible reactions. So what we see here, um, to start off, we have colored water, some green water here. Um, that represents our reactant side of our process. And then, of course, we have our empty container over here that represents our um, product side of the process. So in any good reaction, when you start the process, everything's a reactant. So we all have all the water over here, and nothing is a product. Um, when you have a reversible reaction, or a reaction that has to be... I'm just going to take a moment to go grab coffee, because I think that'll help me be a little more clear. I'm going to play this for just a moment. I'll be right back, and um, we'll, then I'll uh, kind of recap, recap the video um, and probably skip ahead a little bit. Um, so I'll be right back equilibrium, what happens is as soon as you start making product, that product also starts making reactant. So on our very first scoop, if I'm using two identical beakers, if I go in here and scoop, on the very first scoop, all of it is going to be reactant turning into product and none of the other. However, the very next time I scoop, some of my product is actually going to go back into my reactant side. Now if I continue to scoop like this and continue to do this, You'll notice how at first the reaction ran really fast. And at first, a lot of water was switching sides going to the product side. But then it kind of seems to slow down a little bit. And at some point, if I continue to scoop, the amount that I scoop going each direction will become the same. So if I look, I have 250 milliliters here. And I only have 200 on this one, so I'm not quite there yet. Okay. So now if I have 250 milliliters here, I have 225, so I'm getting closer. So I'm almost at equilibrium. And here I have 225, 225. So if we look, and again, this is not perfect measurements, but if we look at our volumes there, they're almost identical. We're showing that the amount that's crossing from here to here is equal to the amount going this way. Now the amount in the beakers represents the rate. Okay, so the rate of transfer is the same. From here on out, I can do this for a day, two days, 10 days, 10 seconds. It doesn't matter. This is at equilibrium. 
Okay, so the amount I take from here goes here, the amount I take from here goes here. Okay, or the top one where the rate flat lines and becomes equal. Okay, now it doesn't mean that we have to have equal amounts. If you look at our tubs, because I was using the same size beaker, the volume level in the tubs are also very similar. So you'd almost get the indication that maybe the amount in each side has to be equal. So it has to be 50% this, 50% that. And that's not necessarily true. If we reset our setup here, and we begin again, but this time, instead of having equal amounts, we have very unequal amounts, where I'll again use the big beaker as reactant. I'm going to use the little guy for my product side. Okay? So in our very first... So this, this point, that, that ratio between the two sizes, that's going to give us our equilibrium constant because essentially what the rate is calculating is the rate at which the products are moving one way and the reactants are moving in reverse. So you'll see in his demonstration real quick that you know the, there's a different rate of exchange, but of course these are first order reactions, so some portion of it is moving in either direction and we end up at an equilibrium based on that ratio of the, the two different rates, the, the speed at which they're going across. So I'll let him finish up this um, one part and we'll, we'll stop it there because that's um, essentially all that, that's useful from this uh, video. Scoop, again, it's all reactant, no product. Again, I start scooping and I get some product back to reactant. Okay. Now you might think there's no way you can get equilibrium here because the big scooper will always outdo the little guy, which is kind of a common thought. But the reality is that doesn't happen. At some point, the big one actually does run out of steam here. Again, we're looking for equal rate of transfer. So if I check, okay, I'm doing 140 milliliters here and here. Again, I'm at about 140 milliliters. So if you look, these two volumes, even though they're in different size containers, again, are showing almost identical volume, which means if I pour 140 into here, and I pour 140 into here, there's no difference, okay? So I am now at equilibrium, okay? So. Okay, so hopefully that was kind of helpful thinking about equilibrium. Um, equations and how they work. Let me make sure I didn't mute myself just now. Okay, good. Okay, so um, one of the things he mentioned, and I think that I found the exact same uh, illustration here that they were using, is we can look at the amount of products and reactants or we can look at the rate of change. And in the, in the portion, you know, if, if we look at them over time, in the portion where the rates are different, we're not yet in equilibrium. At some point we will get equal rates. That's our moment where we've reached the equilibrium or the amount Essentially, when they stop changing amounts, then we've reached equilibrium. So these equilibrium reactions, if we just assume that we start here, essentially, then they become pretty simple. We don't have to worry about um, these dynamics so much. We just we can just say that, OK, well, we know something about the ratio of one to the other at equilibrium, um, given that we know something about the, the chemical conditions like the pH. So that type of knowledge is going to get us um, where we need to go in this case. All right, so I kind of drew a sketch of this last time as well um, for the hypochlorite hypochlorous acid uh, system, um, but these equilibrium reactions, especially the pH dependent ones, can be used for um, quite a different number of species, particularly acid-base chemistry. Here we've got the carbonate system where we have 
H2CO3 is in equilibrium with H plus and HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. And then we've got bicarbonate in equilibrium with H plus and carbonate. So you can see it from essentially from uh, this perspective, you can change what form your uh, carbonation is going to be in based on what form, um, based on the pH essentially. So if you think about it and you're interested in having carbonated beverages, it's an interesting question to pose to ask, what should your pH be? If you want a nice bubbly, carbonated beverage. Well, you can consider that ionic species stay in solution. So anything with a charge is going to be much more likely to stay in solution. So if you're preparing your carbonation, perhaps it makes sense to store it under basic or neutral conditions. But then if you want it to be able to be gas, to have that bubbling experience, you would actually want to first saturate it with the carbonate. Then you would want your pH to be lower so that most of the, the carbonate is in the form of carbonic acid so that this chemical can essentially be driven off by as CO2. Because the one thing that happens is CO2 gas reacts with water to form H2CO3, okay? Um, and I believe this is essentially an equilibrium equation as well in terms of the gas dissolving or, um, or leaving. So we would want this form if we were looking for a, um, a bubbly beverage. So you'd notice that in any soda bottles, any, um, the, if you look at the ingredients list, they probably are using phosphoric acid to achieve, uh, to, and to achieve that acidic condition and keep it buffered to a, a, a low pH. So here we see a, this, with the system of two different ones, um, we have two different pKa's, right? One for this reaction and then one for this reaction. And one thing you'll notice is if you look at the, the fraction, which is, you know, the, the total carbonate, when you get to one, that's 100% of the carbonate in the system. And at very low pHs, just about everything is in the um, carbonic acid form. You get to pH eight or so, we get the peak for bicarbonate, and that's maybe 98%, something like that, of the carbon in the solution is bicarbonate. And then at very basic level, we're getting to all uh, bicarbonate. So what you see here is depending on your pH, you might be, um, you, you can tell which, which one you're more likely to be dealing with. And then in some cases, you can completely ignore one sector. So if I, if I gave you a pH 10, we could pretty much ignore this first reaction here. It's just not going to be relevant. Um, and then we deal with just with this reaction here. If I, if we find this exact point here, you know, 10.3 or something, that's the equilibrium point where these two species are equal. Um, likewise, over here, we can see the same thing. Okay. So how does pH function then? Um, and really, this is just a, a complete review. You all should know this. I'm just going over it just to be sure. Um, the P is functioning as a negative log of. So P of X is equal to negative log of X. Okay, so when we say P 
of h plus, what we're saying is negative log of h plus. Now we, we don't use the bracket or the plus here um, in our normal setting, so that just is pH. So just remember that as you're as you're dealing with these problems. We could even say P of OH, and it would have basically the same meaning, just inverted to, to be tracking the OH instead of the, the, the H plus. Okay, so I mentioned water a few minutes ago. The equilibrium constant for water is 10 to the minus 14. That means that our equilibrium we can find when H plus equals OH minus. And in that situation here, we said this goes to one. So at the moment that H plus equals OH minus, we have equal amounts. That means that we can say, and I'm going to erase this over here. We can say that 10 to the minus 14 equals h plus squared if we, at the time that they are equal. So that means that when equal, h plus equals oh minus. And if you take the square root of 10 to the minus 14, that's going to be equal to 10 to the minus 7. And that right there is where we get our pH scale, right? So that's why pH goes from um, 0 to 14, because that's our equilibrium constant there. You can't really get above 14 um, in the negative direction, and you can't really go um, you know, essentially above 0 in terms of um, how much H plus you have in solution. Okay, so that's, keep that in mind that our, our water equilibrium equation works that way. And that should be helpful. So we can take the pH as negative log of H. That means we can know the H plus concentration whenever we know the, um, the pH. So that's why earlier when I when we were doing that problem with the um, chlorine, we had pH of 7, and I just said 10 to the minus 7. That's where it's coming from. Okay, so hopefully that's just review and you're not learning anything here because you should have seen this a few times by now. Okay, so with that, oops. I want to talk about chloramines again, so the residual chlorine. And essentially, these are more equilibrium reactions. So last time I talked about them, and I said there's monochloramine, there's dichloramine, and trichloramine. And essentially, what's going on is these are equilibrium reactions with one another. Um, so we have the NH3, so some sort of ammonia or amine here. So ammonia reacts with HOCl, and this is a, a rather rapid reaction, but it is an equilibrium reaction. And so we, we get an equilibrium between this ammonia, our free chlorine here, and this monochloramine. Should be one word. I kind of left a gap there. Um, so this has an amine that has one chlorine group on it. Now, technically, you probably could consider this as some organic molecule with the NH um, the NH group on it, and then you substitute one of those H's with a chlorine. That form is probably um, reasonable to describe as well. That would very likely be happening in um, real systems. 
but for the sake of uh, simplicity here, we're just going to keep it as straight ammonia. So that yields water and monochloramine. Then if we take that monochloramine, the same reaction can happen and we substitute another chlorine. Um, and that can go all the way up to NCl3 as a trichloramine. So dichloramine and trichloramine. Okay, so in this system, um, the, the oxidation state for chlorine in every case is plus one. So, which is why, um, which is why it's so reactive here with that plus one when it would rather be minus one. Um, we're essentially, we have a, a highly reactive species here. The chlorine is in plus one, the H is in plus one, and the O is in minus two. And it would much rather react with something, take, it, take their electrons away, and um, satisfy and become um, Cl minus instead of Cl plus. Um, and that, that holds true. It remains that way. We don't have any strange, you know, we don't have any um, redox chemistry occurring here. It just, um, we're just forming that chlorinated amines, essentially. So um, when we talk about chlorine, we almost always use free chlorine, combined chlorine, or total chlorine. So free is really talking about the this um, reactive stuff that is not combined with amine groups. So basically HOCl, OCl minus, and probably we would also consider chlorine dioxide. Basically anything but and chloramines. So then combined is our whatever chlorine that has been combined with the amines. So these are the chloramines. Doesn't matter which ones, just that they are combined with ammonia. Then total, of course, is exactly what you think of. Um, this will be the combined plus free. Okay, so uh, this figure in the upper right corner here shows um, essentially the chloramine to, or let's see, that's the um, dichloramine to chloramine molar ratio. And we're comparing that with the chlorine to nitrogen molar ratio. And we can take a look at how the pH, at different pHs here, we have these different bars how these pHs are affecting the ratio of how much, how much dichloramine we get compared to monochloramine. Okay, so if this number, so di over monochloramines, if that number was greater than one, that means we have more in the form of dichloramine than we do in monochloramine. So we see at pH 5, this is true. We start at about equal amounts, and then as we change this x value, which we'll come back to in a moment, then we get more in the form of dichloramine, whereas most of the time we have less dichloramine. So under basic conditions, we have less dichloramine and more monochloramine. Now this x-axis as we increase, so this is increasing the amount of dichloramine. And we, we want to know about this because monochloramine and dichloramine are functionally a little bit different. You know, they're, they're going to have different reactivities with um, organisms. They're going to have different lifetimes in a distribution system. So we want to know um, how long-lived these are. Typically, we're using monochloramine for most of our 
um, purposes. And so we want to know how much is in that form compared to di or even trichloramine. So down here, this x axis, this is the amount of chlorine as Cl2 compared to nitrogen. So compared to the ammonia available. So in this case, we have quite a, you know, as we increase here, we're, we have more and more chlorine. So the more chlorine we add compared to the nitrogen, you know, I guess we could also remove, remove more nitrogen and that would do the same thing. But the, the higher the chlorine amount, the more likely we're pushing towards the dichloramine and ultimately trichloramine. But we do notice that especially at basic conditions, um, we're not getting a whole lot of um, the dichloramine here. Okay, so this brings us to a key concept about chlorination in general. And this is breakpoint chlorination. You'll see this pretty often when looking at designing a, chlor a chlorination system. And essentially what you're what you're aiming for is an understanding of how much chlorine that you have to apply in order to achieve your design goals. So it would be simple to take the example we looked at earlier and say, okay, we're adding this amount of chlorine and we know that we can disinfect our water if we have a contact time and this you know, X concentration of HOCl and we leave it you know, we give them 10 minutes of contact time and we'll have our disinfection. Um, that's all well and good and works pretty well, but if we have ammonia in our solution, and especially if we don't know how much, maybe, or we're not sure, maybe it fluctuates, then we really need to pay attention to how much chlorine is going to be uh, wasted, so to speak, towards the combined chlorine. And so, at some point, you know, as we are adding more and more chlorine compared to our, um, sorry, my, my phone is ringing. One moment. Sorry about that. Distracting. Okay. So if we think about our, um, essentially our active chlorine that is useful for our system, um, what happens is as we start adding chlorine, you know, this is our total chlorine applied, kind of going left to right, then at some point we're making lots of combined chlorine. And that's um, not particularly useful. It does have some action. And then um, as we add more, we end up having a reduced um, kind of reduction in the effective combined chlorine, such that we're, we're forming the, the dichloramine and the trichloramine. And at some point, we'll break through that curve and then have free chlorine because we've consumed all of the ammonia and we've kind of saturated all of the chloramines that we can form. And then we, this is what we call our break point. And that's essentially our, the ratio of a, the amount of chlorine compared to the amount of ammonia present that we need to get to in order to be effectively increasing the free chlorine with every additional amount of chlorine that we're adding. Okay, so that gets a little bit, um, a little bit more complicated. I'll try to elaborate on that a little bit next time, um, but I wanted to introduce that topic. You'll see this um, pretty frequently, again, in any um, actual application of chlorine to, to real systems. Okay, so with that, um, I wanted to take note of disinfection byproducts. And we'll, we'll probably solve some problems that relate to the formation of disinfection byproducts 
but essentially disinfection byproducts are unwanted and potentially toxic or carcinogenic um, molecules that are going to form when we have these complex organic molecules. They're very large organic molecules, lots of different types of um, functional groups in them, lots of potential to substitute halides, so chlorine, bromide, iodide, uh, fluoride, um, in, in place of um, hydrogens or perhaps just reacting uh, in different locations, maybe consuming a double bond, um, essentially adding these chlorine or halide groups um, can create a molecule that is um, more toxic or harmful than the molecule itself was. So this is a big concern, especially if we have dirty water and we have to add lots and lots of chlorine to get through the breakthrough, uh, the breakpoint uh, chlorination scheme, or perhaps we just have a you know, lot of pathogens and have to do use high dosing. Um, if we have high dosing and lots of organic matter, then we can potentially have issues with these disinfection byproducts. So a kind of simplified view on what these would look like, we have some organic molecule group, maybe that's this whole thing over here, and then at the, the tip of it, maybe we have a methane group, okay? So this would be a typical methane group where each of those, um, each of these here is some hydrogen, atom, some molecule over here. This is just the, the tail end of um, the molecule here. So if we chlorinate this, it becomes Cl, and we still have a couple H's. Now, if we do lots and lots of chlorination, then we could end up with R, C here, the carbon, and Cl on each of the groups. And this would be called a trihalomethane. Now, of course, this could you could use iodide or bromide or something instead of the chloride, but in either case, those are halides, and that's giving you trihalomethanes. Um, the same same can be tr uh, said for haloacetic acids. You can halogenate acetic acid components or acetic acid itself, and have the same type of issue where these are known. Um, known to be harmful molecules. So in order to understand the formation here, um, there's a lot of research going on and there's a lot to be said for the, the type of organic matter that you're dealing with and the conditions of the, of the chlorination when it happens. So these are, it's, it's an interesting um, thing to consider if you if you want to chlorinate for let's say kind of a developing country's application but you don't have any pretreatment steps there is a little bit of a dilemma because you're if you're not careful you're probably forming some um, disinfection byproducts now the health effects for disinfection byproducts are, are certainly going to be chronic if they if they um, show up, whereas having a um, intestinal parasite or some virus or pathogen, food infection, you know, waterborne disease, that's going to be much more immediate. So typically you probably think to yourself, okay, well, let's, let's take the trade off. Let's risk the disinfection byproducts. Um, but it's not ideal um, if, if they're possibly going to be forming. So it's certainly something that, um, it, it complicates the just simply taking chlorine. You actually do want some pretreatment involved um, before the chlorine if, if you're able to. Uh, that way you don't need as much of it and you don't have as much organic matter in the system um, to act as a, a source for these uh, byproducts. Okay, so a few more examples here. Um, 
you know, just taking a look at bisphenol A, the points of attack that chlorine can take. There's a uh, four, you know, each of these uh, corners of the molecules here can, chlorine can oxidize those and add, add the chloride groups there. Um, it's another example for estradiol. These arrows are showing the uh, chlorine attack points. And then um, essentially that, that will end up forming um, these products over here. So there's a lot of research that goes on about um, understanding what's going to form, what that's going to look like, is that going to change its toxicity? And a lot of those studies are going to use um, pretty high resolution uh, mass spectrometry. A lot of times it'll be like an HPLC um, mass spec uh, to calculate and figure out exactly what mass of these molecules that they're observing are um, and how that changes when you induce, you know, when you uh, induce that reaction via chlorination. So it's a, that's a whole field of study uh, understanding what's happening and of course with a near infinite number of organic molecules that can and do exist uh, that that gets quite complicated and then you want to try to classify them in simpler terms that's where we get the things like trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids and there's a few others um, acronyms that are that deal with commonly identified disinfection byproduct functional groups um, to, to help us classify what's going on and understand the risks. Okay, so I want to come to really the quantification side of disinfection, and this is going to be um, where we can understand how to design a system in terms of our, you know, maybe we need 99.9% .9 removal of some pathogen. Um, the contact time or CT concept, excuse me, is really going to get us there in terms of um, the quanti quantification and how to understand the rate, the kinetics. So disinfection, when we're using a chemical, is pretty much going, going to almost always be in a pseudo first order kinetic regime because we have a known, we, you know, we, our chemicals are interacting with the viruses or bacteria or whatever pathogen on a basis of how many pathogens there are. So we're gonna have the number to the one power. So in that sense, it's a lot like any normal first order decay reaction. The, the amount of bacteria is going to decay with time given some rate constant. Um, now we have one complicating factor here is that it also depends on how much chlorine we have or how much uh, whatever chemical we're using. So that's the C here. This is the concentration of our disinfectant and that is going to be um, going to be raised to a power of n here where that's our dilution coefficient. Normally, we will assume that's one for ideal reactors, but imagine you put a drop of chlorine in my aquarium. It's not going to immediately distribute throughout the whole aquarium. In fact, some of the water that's kind of sitting underneath the gravel or something or in the little um, air pipes, some of that chlorine is just simply not going to um, not going to get there, you know, if uh, if we just added a drop in one corner, it's probably going to take a very long time before it dilutes and diffuses and um, and reaches all the different corners. And if the chlorine is at all reactive, which surprise, surprise it is, it may not ever get to the, the nooks and crannies in that aquarium. So uh, given that, this N here can help us, um, it, you know, it can be less than one for a non-ideal reactor. Um, and in particular, this is mixing, 
or dilution. Um, that will give us a way to account for the fact that um, that amount of chlorine that we are describing does not contact all of the water in the solution. Whereas in an ideal reactor, we are assuming that it's perfect mixing um, in the zones that we're considering and that that, um, that allows us to say that this five milligrams per liter is distributed out throughout the whole reactor. Okay, now the other complicating factor here is the concentration of chlorine or ozone, let's say, whatever we're using, could change over time. Now, most of the time we will aim to operate with a constant concentration of our disinfectant, which simplifies this into the first order. If the concentration is changing, then we're not at first order because this is depending on two different things that are changing. So um, C equals constant, and I'll say, we'll say if C equals constant here, then it's essentially first order. Um, and if that's not actually quite true in reality, in some cases, um, so that's why we're calling a pseudo first order. Um, the the Chick Watson kinetics here is what we call this. Um, we call it pseudo first order because that concentration is not always constant. We like to be able to assume that it is, that makes it easier. So when we can, um, when it's reasonable to do so, then we do. Okay, so we have K. K here is our rate constant. But this is, um, here this is a coefficient of specific lethality that's specific to the type of chemical we're using and the type of pathogen that we're disinfecting. And this is going to be in units of liters per milligram per minute. So essentially this is per time, like a typical first order reaction, but it also has to incorporate the fact that we have concentration here of a disinfectant. And so we'll also say times the, the disinfectant concentration, C disinfectant to the minus one. So in terms of units, this is inverse time multiplied by inverse of the concentration units for the disinfectant. So it's essentially how quickly the pathogen is being destroyed per time and per disinfectant that we get to add. Now, it's kind of handy to assume that, that our concentration there is constant, and then we can simplify this K times C to the N into K star. And this is going to be in just per minute or per second or whatever it happens to be. The, the minutes is just an example here. So then, if we make that assumption, then we can say with that k star, dn dt equals negative k star n to the power of one. This is just the same first order decay reaction that we've seen a bunch of times already. So that's nice and, nice and simple there, uh, pretty straightforward if we make those assumptions. Now, um, each k is unique to each pathogen disinfection pair. Here's some data just kind of illustrating this. this. We were actually using, in this case, photo-produced singlet oxygen um, to destroy MS2 bacteriophages. And in this case, it worked really well, in part because it seems that the uh, the photosensitizers were interacting very strongly with the viruses and kind of sticking together and reacting very quickly. Uh, turns out there was more complicating factors here that um, we're still working to understand, um, hopefully putting out um, a new paper on that at some point this year. Now, that brings us to a question. 
how do we get this data? You know, we have profiles of some disinfection occurring and we have all these data points. Well, how do we get those data points? How do we quantify it um, so that we can understand the kinetics? Well, there's a couple of techniques and I wanna go over them uh, with you briefly. The first and in some sense, the gold standard is culturing. So if we take a look at bacteria, we can count how many colonies are forming per unit volume. So we often will do this by either filtering a water sample through a filter to catch the bacteria and then put that filter onto a petri dish with some agar. That's essentially what happened here on the right. Um, then you can count the number of coliform, you know, count the number of bacteria um, per square or per half of this filter or something. You can you get some quantification based on how many bacteria got trapped. Because essentially when a bacteria sticks onto the surface, then and, and we give it nutrients to grow, then it's going to grow into a full colony of bacteria. And that depending on the type of bacteria that usually happens overnight. You get so many bacteria if you give it the perfect conditions that you can visibly see it with your eyes. And that's very handy because, you know, if you've ever tried to count something under a microscope, it probably only takes about 20 seconds before you realize you're, you're in a situation of an impossible task. Um, and you're, you're not going to enjoy that, <laughs> that attempt. So having it in such a way where you can visibly count it with the human eye is just really, really nice. So you can pass it through a filter, maybe 100 milliliters through a filter, and then count how many bacteria you have, bacterial colonies, or maybe you just spread them across a plate with kind of a spreading bar in a sterile environment, and each of these colonies that grow indicate that one bacteria was stuck there. So if you put maybe half of a milliliter on there, spread it all around, and then you get, I don't know, 20, 30 um, colonies, then you know that you have 20 colonies per 50 milliliters or 5 milliliters or whatever you put, half a milliliter. Um, so you, you can quantify how many colony forming units per volume you have. Now this uh, fecal coliform test in particular is kind of an interesting one. It's not truly fecal or not, but it's a decent representation, a decent estimate. And the way it works is you give the bacteria a very specific type of media to grow on that contains a dye that will turn some of these colonies blue if they have a specific type of um, cellular process. You also, if you're looking at total versus fecal coliforms, there's another um, way we classify the difference there based on how much temperature we give them to incubate. And we can have some very crude methods of discriminating between types of bacteria if we're taking like a field sample and we don't really know what type of bacteria we have. It helps give us some kind of estimate of how much of these bacteria are just natural lake bacteria, for example, versus bacteria that entered a lake from some animal source. Um, that type of thinking um, can help us understand to an extent how, how bad the contamination is. Okay, we can also do culturing for viruses. So here we have a couple of examples. We can do uh, platforming units where we have plaques of viruses growing where we would have had a blanket of bacteria. So if we take some bacteria that a virus infects, in my lab we, we've been using MS2 bacteriophage infecting E. coli, and it'll look a lot like this, where we spread a whole bunch of E. coli across an entire petri dish of nice nutrients, then um, then we infect those bacteria with some amount of viruses. 
And those viruses will essentially interrupt this blanket formation of E. coli or of whatever bacteria we're growing. So whereas we would have had a, a plate that was absolutely completely covered with our bacteria, we see these little plaques where one virus, or presumably one virus, maybe one cluster of viruses, landed, infected a cell, and then burst and infected the neighbor cells and burst and kept bursting until we see these little plaques that are essentially a whole bunch of viruses there and dead, dead um, bacteria cells. So those little plaques, they look different and we can therefore count the um, effectively the number of viruses per, um, per volume. We can also do that with animal tissue cells um, and see how, how many um, cells are alive or dead um, or how many plates, let's say, look like the cells are not doing very well. Um, when we get to animal and um, or human tissue cells, the processes take a lot longer. It takes longer for those cells to grow. It becomes a lot more difficult. It's, you don't really get the nice blanket plaque situation, so you have to use a little more statistics. And it, it's um, a lot more expensive. It, it's just harder to deal with if you go that route into um, more realistic models of um, of humans. Um, so it, it's something that can be done, that is done, but it's a, a little bit more challenging, whereas this platforming thing for bacteriophages, for example, is a very convenient way. Again, it happens overnight and gives a very nice quantitative look at how much um, viable pathogens are in the solution. Or in this case, maybe a pathogen surrogate, some other virus that we assume that behaves enough like the pathogen that we can understand how how much disinfection we will achieve if we if we use this quantification tool. Okay, so I said earlier that the culturing is essentially the gold standard. What I meant by that was it's it gives us a viability count, meaning we know how much how many of these viruses or bacteria are able to reproduce. And that's very convenient because um, we want to know not only how many are there, but also how many are capable of reproducing. Um, and that kind of brings us to uh, the another tool. If we use some sort of DNA analysis, like um, quantitative PCR, we might be able to have a, a reasonable estimation of the quantity of um, DNA material uh, with the system where we are essentially multiplying or splitting and then multiplying DNA strands. We're doing that over and over again and then watching the signal from these DNA strands um, increase over time. That's useful and it can give us a lot of good information about the type of, you know, a very specific type. You know, you can, you can do this for um, an exact species, an exact um, set, set of DNA, um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the viability. You don't know if you have all of these virus um, DNA particles. For example, in, the, in wastewater, we've been sampling for COVID, uh, but that, um, that signal that we find is not necessarily um, showing us anything about how many of those viruses are alive in the wastewater, even though we see them quite often, um, chances are good that there's very few viable um, COVID viruses in the wastewater because we know that they decay rather quickly in, uh, in water. So especially if you had it sitting there for a couple of days, um, there's not going to be very high quantity of the um, viable coronaviruses, even though you might have a, um, a pretty strong PCR signal. Okay, so there's a, a couple of pros and cons here. I, 
you know, when we're under, wanting to understand what's in an environmental sample, do we have norovirus here? The PCR is definitely the way to go. Um, but in terms of assessing, you know, a disinfection treatment process, then PCR only has limited functionality for us. Um, so I wanted to kind of cover those quantification aspects of disinfection, um, kind of to, to tie in these concepts and to help you better understand where we're getting the chick lots and kinetics and how do we determine that experimentally. Okay, so that's, um, I think that's about all I've got for you today. Um, the last slide here is a disinfection problem. Um, we can take this as practice. Um, feel free to work that on your own or we'll, we'll pick up here next time and then talk about UV disinfection. Okay, uh, any questions before, before we end? All right, so if not, um, I'm hearing lots of thunder outside, so I'm glad, uh, glad we're not all driving through that now. So I will see you guys on Tuesday, and you can expect to hear back from me on, regarding the, um, the critical review assignment grades um, sometime tomorrow. All right, so have a good weekend. See you next week.